Well, um, I guess I'm doing the promised reviewing of VR, home VR stuff. Um, I think I said last year I might actually consider doing this, and now I'm doing a little more in-depth and I know a lot more since then, which is good. Um, first of all, I wanted to talk about um, some VR hardware options, um, mostly by going over what I have and my thoughts on there. So this is the Oculus Quest. This is pretty much your good introductory VR system, and they've made it where you can step this up a bit. A lot of the stuff in here looks complicated, but I just have a lot of peripherals. Really, it mostly comes down to the controllers and the headset, and everything else is additional ways to, um, you know, additional options, sound options, glasses options, charging options, etc. But um, the Quest is nice because it is very standalone. Um, you couldn't play it. You could play it on its own with just everything I have in here, with less than what I have in here. But this gives you more sound options, charging options, etc. Uh, even streaming options. Um, this one, well, the way it, I don't know entirely how it works, but I know the head is actually able to track where it is in space pretty well. Um, <clears throat> I'm not sure how it does, but it knows how high off the ground it is. It knows where in your room it is. It's actually pretty elaborate because I've turned this on on the other side of the room and it knew that it had been set up over on this side before and I could see it from inside VR headset. So it's a very elaborate system. Usually the problem with this is it's underpowered compared to other VR systems because it is standalone. It is basically running off of the Android hardware that is within the headset itself. But recently um, Oculus has come out with a um, link cable so you could link it up to your computer get a full VR option so you know VR home VR is getting better these are the controls they're a little weird because you kind of think that the rings should go out like that but they actually go in like this um, these controls well pretty simple take a single AA battery I've not had to change them yet hence why this backup AA battery pack is still unopened but it's very interesting the controls um, know when buttons are pressed but they also know when you're fingers are on the button so they can do that and I've heard people talk about complete finger tracking but you can kind of see you can't exactly hold them perfectly in all forms so it's probably going to be limited to a certain degree but it's pretty good the few games I've used to play this you know have worked pretty well um, but my only complaint is that the lensing on the headset itself feels slightly flatter I guess you don't notice this while you're playing VR per se but I've noticed it kind of more long-term feeling like hmm something feels a little flatter than it really should but usually that's just you know it's, it's not been that bad the quest is a pretty good introductory and again thanks to the link cable you now have the ability to upgrade to something else. So that's an example of a VR system which is pretty much self-tracked. Um, next up is the one I usually spend most of my time on which is the HTC Vive. Um, which is older. This is I think the standard version in its previous generation. I think Vive and Valve have both come up with um, second generation stuff. The controls a little more bulky. Um, it's a little less hand tracky. The trackpads can tell where on them your finger is and you can press different directions so it's got it's got the ability to be repartitioned in different ways it's got buttons on the side triggers on the thing menu-ish buttons here it works out pretty well it's kind of weird looking at it this way but you know it, it, it works surprisingly well um, for all the things I think mostly because Home VR is evolving with this stuff, and this stuff is evolving with home VR. Um, about the only complaint I actually have is that these controllers are prone to a little problem here. This is my third controller to be doing that, and I'm just a lazy fuck, and I just um, buy replacements. 
But, um, Vive works differently from Quest in that, um, these, bi these pieces of hardware track where they are based on, um, lighthouses that you set up. So I have one in the corner up there. And I have one on the opposite side of the room up there. So the idea is they need to see each other so that they can sync. If they can't see each other, you do have the ability to plug in a cable to do it. But they broadcast out light and they agree with each other on timing and stuff like that. And unlike the um, Quest, you can see that these have all these little holes all over the place. They, um, I call them holes, let's just call them dimples or something. They allow them to figure out where the lighthouses are and track pretty accurately, although every once in a while, um, if not everything is perfectly set up, if your lighthouses can't agree on each other, you can get weird drifting problems. Um, and because that's sending out light, it also means that you can also have things that confuse people, which is why um, over here I've covered this glass cabinet with um, a blanket so that reflections don't peek through and confuse the equipment. Um, and th that seems like a lot, I think. You know, th certainly the Quest cer sounds a lot better, but the advantage of the Vive is this system allows for more stuff to be added on a lot more easily. And in particular, um, we've got the puck. Now, it's my understanding this blue triangle means it actually supports the next generation of Lighthouse, Lighthouse 2.0, which um, equipment that supports Lighthouse 2 also supports Lighthouse 1, but Lighthouse 1 equipment can't use Lighthouse 2 because there's a sync signal that um, is not there. Lighthouse 2 supports more towers, which I think three towers instead of two towers, which allows you to get better tracking. But the point is, you have this, which is a more arbitrary thing. This this is just called a puck, and this is designed to track things in 3D space. And things is just a very generic term. You have to configure in Steam what you want them to be, and I think you can do that per game, or maybe it's rather per program. In this case, you can see that I actually have this attached to a Velcro belt system. This is part of full body, and full body is usually what um, drives people towards um, the Vive and the Valve solutions because the Lighthouse solution allows you to do this a lot easier and Oculus I th think mostly requires you to hack something else together. Right? The most common one I've heard is we're losing focus there. The most common one I've heard is uh, using the Kinect for example but it uh, I don't know the exact details of that. All I know is at least with the Vive solution you can get three of these pucks and a belt system and basically track left foot right foot and waist why would you do that mostly just for it it increases the immersiveness of um vr i'll tr i'll try and show an example but first let's talk a little bit about vr spaces so it's definitely nice to define a big space um to do vr stuff in uh, i think uh, i don't know that all the systems have a definitive um, same thing that they all say, but again, it's only nice. A lot of, um, at least both of the things I've seen, understand that sometimes you're relegated to a smaller area and maybe you have more clutter and you only have like space in front of you to maybe do stuff like that. The Quest is definitely designed to do stuff more like that, but if you wanted a more complete VR experience, it is kind of nice to have a bigger space where you can do a little walking around or maybe lying down or stuff like that. I've seen people who, um, you know, kind of compromise by not having a big space, but they can lie down in their bed, for example, because the VR is set up in the room. For me, um, it's here in the living room, and because I keep it modular, I can keep this space. I can put chairs in here, take chairs out as I need, and for me, this is barely right there with um, the maximum, or not the maximum, the bigger play size you can find. Now, I'm a little more 
reckless because with VR chat I'm usually um, relaxing and not doing anything actiony. So I actually tend to keep a chair actually slightly within my play space. You know, technically you don't have to be in your play space as long as um, your VR equipment. Well, okay. I know the Quest gives you complaints if you walk outside of your defined play space. But for the Vive, um, as long as the lighthouses can see you, you're okay. A lot of this stuff exists more to help you deal with the fact that when you're in VR, um, <clears throat> you don't want to accidentally crash into obstacles. You know, you don't want to accidentally hit your TV. So if you're playing and you're close to this side of it, you will be able to see that you're actually close to this and be able to relocate yourself a little closer to the center. And at that point, it depends on how well the games um, define your controls to allow you to change like that. I know a game like Super Hot, for example, it's very easy to find yourself facing a dire direction you don't want to and doing stuff you don't want to. And you had to, there was a way to recenter it, but um, I forget off the top of my head. But <clears throat> that's a common thing. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned before about needing to be wary about reflective services if you're using a lighthouse system. Another thing I've found is that the lighthouse system has a tendency to interfere with electronics. So I have my TV and my DVD player over here, and those are the main two signals. I guess I also have my Nintendo Switch. And I've noticed that um, when that lighthouse is on, it's a little trickier to run, so I have it on a little thing that I can turn on and off really quickly. This one I haven't had as many issues, so you know what? So um, when it comes to calibrating um, VR for a home, you're gonna have slightly different ways to do it, but most systems are the same. I'm using the Quest because this one is pretty much designed in order for you to, um, you know, figure this out or do this on the fly. So I've got it on, and I'm redefining what it calls the um, guardian boundary. So mostly, most of these systems use controllers. So you place the controller on the floor to confirm the floor level. You know, that's really good. Um, the Vive requires you to track the edge of your play space um, using the controller itself, as in like you place the controller and you press a button without your headset on. Since the Quest is designed to be used with the headset, instead it uses a pointer system where you can kind of draw on the floor. You can go whoop, 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 and go around the chair there. You know, I'm, I'm not going to do anything too elaborate. You know, uh, you can kind of, you know, you can see through the front of the camera. It's really quite nice. You can look for places where you're like, yeah, I can make that edge go out a little bit more. Yeah, just a little bit more there. You know, you don't have to do anything too elaborate, but you have controls built in. And then I confirm, and I can see a grid around me. I'm going to try and get a picture of Vive's version of it, but it's the same. This calls it a guardian boundary. The Vive calls it the chaperone bounds. It all works the same, and... You know, the interesting thing is my quest actually remembered that I had defined a um, boundary here before and I just had to tell it to do it completely from scratch. Uh, let's see, I guess uh turn it off by pressing that button. But, it's a lot easier to do from scratch with the quest. Um, because the Quest is designed to do that really easily. Whereas the Vive, because you set up the lighthouses and those are supposed to be permanent, um, that's a little bit more of a long-term thing. So that would pretty much be one of the reasons why it's really easy to just keep using the Vive, even if the setup is a little trickier than the Quest. Interesting trade-off there. Um, let's see. I think the next thing I want to do is actually walk through um, setting up a um, <clears throat> full body thing from scratch, a full body session. 
So I always begin with bringing some water in. Um, usually the pucks are what define how long you can be on VR, at least with the full body stuff. And since those last about four hours, that means you can go four hours. So it's a good idea to generally um, keep yourself hydrated. I mean, it's a good idea in general, period, but yeah. So as you can see, I've already, I went over there to turn that lighthouse on, give them a chance to sink. I need to plug these headphones in. Usually I um, pick up the controllers next and use these to turn the system on. So the system can be, you know, the software can be starting up. And while that's happening, I deal with the juggling of uh, the pucks, which this time we have all three. As a general rule of thumb, um, in order to make sure everything goes well, you always set up the pucks in the same order. In this case, uh, I've been setting them up left puck or left foot. And as I do it, I'm as I'm putting them on, I'm also turning them on. And then for the waist, uh, this one I like to do underneath my um, my suspenders. I did not quite get that turned on. You know, you, you need to make sure you check the lights as you go. Uh, the idea behind putting them underneath the suspenders is they're not going to fall below the pants. They're not going to fall above them. They, they get stuck right here no matter what. Which is pretty cool. And that's everything. So at this point, I have to deal with the long hair. So anybody, male, female, whatever, with long hair, you don't have to do anything too fancy. Just get it pulled back when you put the headset on. Then you can get your headphones on. Since my headphones have a particularly long cable, I tuck that away in the pocket. And there we go. I'm completely started up. All right. So this is, I guess this is the way Steam Home works by default. Um, you know, it looks really good from here inside the headset. I don't know if it looks anywhere near as well. This isn't the default home, but it is a slightly expanded version of the default home. You can see here, I can see my controllers. I can't see my waist trackers, but if I press a button, I can see my full body tracking down there. And you have full access to a bunch of Steam stuff here, as well as the ability to go to the desktop, where, as you can see, I have OBS running, and um, <clears throat> Yeah, I can see that I can see myself there. You know, you, you have access to a lot of stuff. Um, in front of you, right here, I think this is generally what this considers front, you have access to your Steam stuff. Um, recent apps would is usually, you know, what you're going to be interested in here. You can see it's talking about top games. Uh, if I move forward a bit, you should be able to see the um, Chaperone Bounds. You know, uh, here in... Steam VR, they are very um, straight liney. Uh, I think the Quest One generally tends to be a little more open. Um, this kind of shows our default movement option, where you can see I can say I want to teleport over here. Uh, what I actually wanted to do was grab this little pyro here and you know just make them bigger and. Uh, uh oh, I accidentally pressed the button. Oh, I did not know I could change its colors. Hmm. Well, you learned something new. Throw them out there. Uh, let's see. There's other random things you can do out here. I think uh, it just decided to start playing the um, ambient noise. But, you know, this is kind of your intro to VR. And this here would be the way to fire stuff up really quick so i think um you know there's a lot of games galgun vr is actually pretty fun uh these are other things i fired up beat saber is there but i wanted to do some vr chat in this case i'm going to just introduce you all to some of the concepts i think now i try to 
stand in the center here. You know, give it a chance to load up. It's going to load into my default home world, which is just the default VR chat world. Um, and if I look down right now, you'll kind of see my avatar is just standing there. This is actually a unique feature of the full body experience where you're in a calibration mode where you have to press on Vive, you have to put, press both triggers. And now, as you can see, <clears throat> you know, here I am just standing around being my avatar. Um, you know, left controller moves, right controller turns. Um, I guess that's one interesting thing. So in the Steam Home, you saw that I was using teleporting. Uh, you actually have something similar to, to that here in VR chat, where, as you can see there, I'm using this to walk around. So if I want to, I can say, yeah, I'll just teleport here. I don't really teleport. People see me walking around, see my voice coming from wherever my avatar is. But um, as you can see, its arms aren't moving. They're just locked in place. It's moving around, doing whatever it wants. If I go here, you can see I can make that mirror turn on. Mirrors are very important for making sure you're looking okay. Um, <clears throat> but, oh, I guess I, huh, it, it is letting me do some limited movement, but this is called the hollow port, um, and I generally turn that off. That does require some more um, adjustment on your part because you have to get used to the ground sliding beneath your feet, but it's honestly not that hard. It's, it's, it's a bit of a trip initially, but it works out pretty well. Huh? Oh, yeah. I was wondering what that thing in the mirror was, and that's my microphone signal. But I think you can hide on desktop. Um, you know, comfort turning. So right now, my avatar turns in discrete chunks. I've generally liked that, kept it there, but if we turn it off, uh, then woo, woo. And that takes some getting used to as well. But I feel like I have more mechanical control like that. And call me an old school gamer or whatever. Personal space. Usually you want to turn personal space off. It, that's just a comfort and safety thing. That makes it where when other people's avatars get close to you, they disappear. Um, and so usually you kind of want to interact with people. You can't headbat people or receive headbats by people because when they're within arm length, they disappear, you disappear. But, you know, if, if you're not comfortable with that, you can always have personal space turned on. You User real height is usually pretty important. If you... Like, if I keep setting this up, you know, I'm not really six foot three, obviously. Uh, you, you could see that my view was adjusting, and this avatar is a bit hard to see. Let's actually... Go back down to 5.8. If I switch to another avatar, I'm going to actually switch to Monica. I think if we see this adjustment... You'll see she's kind of kneeling. And if you go the other direction, if it's too short... Usually they're standing on their tiptoes, although I don't see her. So let's just keep that around what I think my real height is. And you've got a lot of other options here. World volume is usually not supposed to be down like that, but um, I think that's just where I happened to be last time I was on. Um, you can see here, I'm. whenever I switch avatars, I have to recalibrate. That's mostly for the lower body. The upper body stuff tends to work just fine. Um, I think full body has this option to recalibrate in the menu here. So, um, the nice thing about VR chat is, you know, there's not a whole lot of need to do a whole lot of control stuff. And this is a good example, of just VR control stuff in general. But, um, <clears throat> you know, like I said, the main thing on the controller here is this is going to be your move 
Oh yeah, that one can do mouse wheel stuff. Um, this one will be your turning. Um, hand gestures are kind of an interesting thing. Where on quests, you generally like if you want to do a thumbs up, you're gonna do a th just a thumbs up sort of shape on the quest controller itself. I think the rift may be similar. Whereas here on the Vive, you just press a direction and you got your V, your rock and roll, finger gun, finger point. Uh, you know, these reset buttons on the side are also the hand, the open hand. Although a lot of that stuff can be um, overridden, which you know, I did with this avatar. I created a, this pinching hand shape as an example. Um, and you got access to the menu. Oh, triggers will, of course, allow you to click on things. So I could select one of these avatars. You know, these are just some simple avatars that they give you in your intro world. But you don't have to use those. But when I press the menu button, I can go to the menu here and I can go to avatars. These are stuff that have been favorited. There's only like 16 slots for those. You can see down there it mentions 16. And then here you can really just have as many things that you upload as you want. And of course they have these public default ones. Whereas Avatar Worlds, well, that's usually how people get stuff. Um, now, a lot of this stuff, you may be thinking, well, maybe I don't need VR for all this. And that's the nice thing about VR chat is it supports people that are on desktop. Um, and if people have, you know, performance issues, you can actually, you know, set this up so that uh, some avatars get performance blocked automatically. Quest does that very automatically and... I think a lot of quest users just have to show a lot of avatars. Dynamic bones. Um, these tend to be calculation heavy. So if you have a very low processor computer, you could limit dynamic bone usage if you wanted to. Uh, dynamic bones is basically the thing making this hat bounce back and forth or this dress wave. You know, it t tends to be used to make hair wave a little bit as well. This ribbon kind of has some on it, but... Uh, <sighs> and, you know, dy dynamic bones is basically stuff that kind of has physics to it that should just be calculated dynamically. So I think if I jump, you'll see, like, some of that there. Queen Buet has a really magnificent thing where she's got these sleeves. Woohoo! Lots of simple stuff. Uh, I know I'm flying through the controls real fast because I didn't expect to fire up VR chat, but you know, it's easier to just show doing something. And it is pretty natural to point and do stuff. Uh, let's see. What's an example of a world? Maybe we're going to go to the Room of the Rain. We're going to create a, an invite only instance so that we don't get any unexpected visitors. See, it's got a nice ambience to it, good rain, and a panel here, which as you can see, lights up. So if I ever wanted to turn the rain down, I could, or if I wanted to just make it a little quieter, I could. I could add thunder. This is just something that the user of this world did, you know, really good job. Fireflies, that would be all these random lights out here. As you can see, it's pretty natural to point and click on things. Turn that off. Let's turn snow on. It's a weird effect. Hmm. Don't know how well y'all can see the billboarding effect. Hmm. Uh, a lot of worlds have mirrors in them. Mirrors are... I mentioned the mirror thing before. Uh, you also have the ability to do lower ones that only... Um, Light, uh, I guess, allows you to play around with the avatar lights. 
so you can see avatars better. I don't know. Lots of simple things. I know a lot of this is like, oh, geez, he's just flying through the controls. And that's fair, because, you know, I'm here a lot. I can say I've been to the Room of the Rain a lot, the Great Pug a lot, the Black Cat a lot. I haven't played Murder 2 a whole lot, but I've played a good amount. Uh, I've never been there. Solipak Jai? Hmm. Never, ever, ever. Yep, yep, yep. So, if you're joining a VR chat for the first time, if you like these default avatars, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but everybody's seen these avatars all the time. This one is a popular one for Russians. I don't know why they like certain ones. Where's, where's the other one? There's this bug-headed alien thing. They really like that one, too. There's a lot of defaults that look fine. Uh, a lot of these ones that they did more recently are pretty cute. You know, there's nothing about these that look wrong. The only issue you might run into is people would look at these and say, Oh, yeah, that's a default avatar. Which probably doesn't mean too much because... Well, usually if you're going to try and find more... Um, Avatars, you're going to look for avatar worlds. Um, I think they kind of have a thing here. Although avatar testing, I don't think has avatars. It's more for testing avatars. Sheep of Paradise does have avatars. Let's just create another invite only. Go there real quick. Uh, yeah, let's let's point a little more forward. I haven't actually walked around this world since the Christmas update. You know, this one has a big mirror. This one also has a thing that can be turned on there. Uh, these flashlights are kind of interesting. They allow you to see polygons, and it of course has a dark area where you can see like you can see what parts of your avatar look what they look like in the dark and as you can see mine has glowing eyes that that was intentionally done it was one of the cool features if you're curious about the height of the avatar this one looks like it's about oh yeah it's about five eight same as me you have some that are really small let's do this one this one's Two foot eight. If you prefer metric, I think this one's metric. But unfortunately, I know my um, my um, imperial a little bit better. Uh, but yeah, let's um, really quickly go to an avatar world. Um, you you could actually either find them just. Searching around here, Yumi's Avatar World uh, has a lot of... Yeah, I don't know. Oh, jeez. Avatar Collections looks like it has a lot. Why don't we go to... JoJo's World. Because that one's a little better. You can usually search... Um, let's look for trying... There we go. I'm really trying. It's an avatar world. New no instance. Invite only. Go. <coughs> this one's kind of noteworthy because um, the person that uploaded it, when um, you know, she tends to wear avatars, shark avatars like that. But um, as you can see here, um, this thing says, "Let's go over here and look at." Um, this one says PC and Quest right there, and that's one of the advantages of this. A lot of these avatars um, are available through other means, which I'm going to probably show after this, but they're uploaded for both PC and Quest. I do that for my avatars as well. If you look at my avatar stats, you know, I've got 24,000 polygons, which is up. Uh, I think the Quest normally suggests a 5,000 to 10,000 polygon range, but 
it can support a lot bigger. It just, when you get a lot of people swapping into these bigger avatars, the quest does become prone to crashing. And I think the quest users prefer that over um, the avatars that are made quest compatible. Um, a lot of this stuff is just details. As you can see, I go crazy with the audio sources. Um, I think um, probably the best example is... This is a quest compatible Bowsette, and there's a lot of things about it that are nice. As you can see, it's still at 15,000 polygons. Uh, I guess I go back, and if I'm going to change, I'm going to change like that. Uh, that's right. I need to calibrate. Uh, you can see, like, fingernail missing there, fine, whatever. Uh, but the hands bend weird, the knees bend weird. Um, and a lot of that came from the decimation process to create it, to get it down, whereas this was the original model. And if you take a look at this one, it's got twice as many polygons. But I guess I shouldn't just say it, because as you can see, those are pretty good looking hands. Everything's bending and looking fine. So, I think quest users choose to accept the occasional quest crashes for a chance to have a better VR chat experience in general. And, again, this world is really nice because JoJo went absolutely nuts. Like, this may look empty right now, but if I turn this on, all these avatars turn on. If I go down here... You know, there's more avatars here. Um, and this is just really nice because even if, if your quest, if your quest, you're going to have to look for these quest supported avatars. And most of them are going to be both PC and quest. A couple are quest only. And it is pretty common for there to be PC only avatars. Like um, up here, you can see Spider Miko here is got only the blue dot next to it. So it is PC only. Um, <clears throat> You'll just have access to a lot of avatars here as a Quest user, and as a PC user, you'll have access to a lot of avatars, but you will also um, be able to be seen by Quest users who want to see your avatar. It's just kind of nice. It's it's just a nice way to, um, you know, make sure you're um, making the community enriched with your presence, I guess spawn to go up here. You don't have to. She has a bunch of teleporty things. But you know, this is, you know, a good example. And usually you look for worlds. There's a lot of other worlds out there with a lot of options. But I'm going to try and show you some alternative ones. But for the most part, you got this stuff. And if there was anything else worth mentioning, let's see. If you're a PC user, um... So you've kind of seen that I do a bunch of hand gestures, just kind of naturally. I point naturally. I do this naturally. You, you can't talk with your hands with the desktop. So that's what I meant by PC. I meant desktop users because, anyways, um, it's also pretty common for hand gestures to be tied to things. I keep that pretty simple where right now this open hand gesture makes my avatar smile like this. You can see the blinking's really weird. Um, but you do have the ability to use keys to set your hands to certain shapes. So avatars that really that are really driven by this stuff, um, like this one can do this stuff. Um, and we can't see it, but it also has some facial expressions. Let's see. This brings the tail up front. So I can combine, bring the tail up front and the ears the back. That's right, I can do this with the ears. Uh, but you could also combine that with any face emotions and whatnot. And you can do that on desktop as well thanks to Shift F1 with left shift controlling your left hand and right shift F stuff controlling the right. Pretty cool stuff. It means there's a lot of options. But um, other than that, Basically, um, actually, let's not open that too much. Um, basically, other than that, um, 
other little controls. Everybody has access to these emojis. They're always the same. Your thumbs up. Your splashing water. There we go. Emotes is... There's a bunch of default ones, but they can be overridden, and I like to override stuff. You know, death longer is common, I think. And I got a couple different versions of the audio for that. But yeah, usually, what do you do in VR chat? Uh, you probably begin by just going to random places, playing some random games. Like up here, we saw that um, Murder 2 was there. Murder 2 and Murder 3 are pretty fun. I bet if we search for Murder, maybe we can see Murder 3 as well. Unless I got taken down. We got Murder 2 and Murder 3. Murder 3. They're, but they're the same general idea, it's just Murder 3. I'm sorry, I'm, lo I'm looking over on the right side here, because I was just wondering. Murder 1 disappeared a long time ago. I think when they uploaded Murder 2, Murder 1 went away. And I think the idea is Murder 1 was created when there wasn't Quest. So Murder 2 and Murder 3 support PC and Quest, which is great, because it means there's cross-compatibility. But... um. You know, this is an example of a little game. You can play that. There's, um, you know, there's there's card games. There's slides. Usually, you don't do a lot of this stuff. You can see some werewolf stuff. Um, Cards Against Humanity is right there. Oh, joking, joking hazard. That's right. I was having trouble reading that. Employed card game. You know, th there's fun games you can play. Usually, you don't play VR chat with the expectations that the games themselves will be fun. Usually, you're doing it to socialize and hang out, which means you'll start making friends, maybe existing people you know or other stuff. You'll friend people and go to social, usually, and see what are your friends up to. Oh, is that what they're doing? I'm going to go hang out with them. And then you're like, Locate your chair. You know, I'm using the chaperone bounds to kind of figure out where I am. So then I can use the table and sit down. You know, this is a very common pose to see me in. Full body people do tend to be a little more sitting down or laying down in VR chat, I think. Like something about the experience makes it feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm really here. I'm really sitting here. It's pretty cool. Lying down on the ground can actually be kind of pleasant because of this. Especially when you're in worlds where there's just things to look at, I guess. But that's kind of the walkthrough of a lot of this stuff. I know, I'm just doing a very quick dump. The camera option is something that is generally only going to be um, available to VR users. So if you're using desktop, you know, you don't have that option. You can take a picture of yourself if you really want to. I don't know. That's that's stuff. Is there anything else worth mentioning? Um, you know, you do have some ability to control audio. That's the world audio there. That's the audio coming from avatars. For example, um... You know, if you didn't want to hear people doing that, you could always turn avatars down. If you don't want to hear people speaking, you could turn voices down, or you could select a person and mute them. And you can see here, this is a, an option that just appears. So, the ranking system is kind of down here. I say kind of because... Um, VRChat definitely tracks beyond trusted, but they only display up to trusted user. Um, and I guess the idea here is normally you start at visitor. I do recommend if you are going to do VRChat, set avatar feature shield settings. They say it's beta, but it seems like it's been this way forever. I don't know what's changed. Um, <clears throat> you start as visitor. So your name tag would be um, 
gray like this, and then very quickly you'll get to blue, green, orange, purple, and friends will always show up yellow, so they stand out in the crowd. Um, but I don't think you rank up if you are if you log in through Steam or you log in through the Quest. So it, it is recommended that you create a VR chat account. You can save yourself a lot of headache by doing that initially. But um, if you've already logged in through the other, you already have friends and avatars and worlds that you saved. Because, uh, like, I guess if I go here to this world, I could favorite it. Oh, I have it favorited. I could make it my home, all that stuff. Um, <clears throat> you know, if you already have that stuff, there is a process for upgrading it. Um, I don't know it myself since I never did upgrade my old Steam account. But you do have the option to do that. Um, that's right, safety. Otherwise, uh, let's actually stand back up. Even though I am completely used to doing that. Stand back up. So once you have the ability to rank up, you know, visitors are just visitors. And by default, a lot of these shield settings turn a lot of stuff off. I keep everything on by default and just turn problematic people off if I need to. Usually you don't have to if you have a high tolerance. You know, you can do whatever you want. But uh, once you become a new user, you can start uploading avatars. And I think user allows you to report worlds. Known user allows you to hide and appear as a user. I, li I like appearing green. It feels a little friendlier. I think you can see up there I'm green, but if I do this, then you know, there's purple around me it, you know that that looks a little friendlier anyways that's a lot of vr chat stuff i just i didn't expect to do this all in one go but i guess i did so let's um try to move on to avatar related stuff because i know a lot of this seems complicated but there are multiple levels of this and it's actually really easy to do introductory stuff Okay, so when it comes to uploading avatars, um, the first thing you're going to want to do is pretty much, I think there's two sites that are pretty much the helpful thing to do. VRChat.com has a developer documentation here, and I know that sounds pretty scary, but the truth of the matter is some of this stuff is pretty simple. Um, like this talks about the setting up of Unity. It suggests that you install um, Unity Hub. I actually suggest you do that just because you know, Unity Hub would make a multiple version juggling easier, specific version juggling easier, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. It talks about avatar stuff, whatever. A lot of this stuff is maybe going to be <clears throat> complicated, maybe not. But usually, you use VR Chat to figure out setting up the development kit first, and then you use VRC mods. Um, <clears throat> as your real first introductory step. They have a little tutorial section here, how to install avatars, you know, it's a quick little, this, look, it's, it's not even a two minute long video. This one talks about creating a little more from scratch. So the idea here is um, <coughs> basically, um, th this is about how to use VRC mods to get your first avatar uploaded. The advantages of that would just be that it's under your own control and you'll be able to do more intricate things as you learn more about the process. But short term, you can just get an avatar up that looks the way you want and Unity gives you credit for doing that. <clears throat> we could do examples where I search. You can see that there's stuff here, Nanachi Ghost, that looks like it's using the cute shader um, distance thing. Yeah, oh, an MRI scanner. That's an interesting thing to have uploaded. But why don't we do something simpler? I have this I opened up a long time ago. I'm not even quite sure if I'm going to be doing anything with this. If you're not familiar with her, she's a character from Pokemon Alpha, Ruby, and Omega Sapphire. Or was that the other way around? Uh, anyways, <clears throat> I'll go ahead and just download this. You can see down here that I've been downloading stuff like crazy because um, 
up here. Th this is pretty much all Avatar related work. There's a couple of things in here that aren't, but usually I'm searching for assets or trying to do other things. But for the most part, I got that. Um, you can see, if I go to tools here, you can see I had Unity Hub. I also installed the version of Unity they originally talked about, but I do everything through Unity Hub. We're going to open downloads here because, um, you know, we got Zinnia there, right there. And here's where most of my avatar work work actually is. You can see I actually have three instances of Unity open. Basically, I have one in which I'm doing most of my avatar developments. I have one in which I'm doing, uh, you can kind of see at the top here that says <clears throat> new Unity project, PC, Mac, and Linux standalone. That basically means that I just went with the default name and then I just stuck with it. Whereas this one, I call this one Quest, and this one is um, set up to be Android development. So usually I develop a PC version of uh, an, an avatar here, and then I upload a Quest version, and I have this over here, which is where we're actually going to be poking around today. Let's click on that. This one, I call this Misc Turret. The idea being that um, I'm trying to keep my the contents of my Unity organized, and this is where I'm like, eh, I don't know what this new package is going to be like, so let's throw this in here and see if I even want it. <clears throat> Omega Ruby, Alpha Sapphire, Zinnia. So, oh, yeah, this, this one's pretty good. It is common for there to be excess stuff in here, but, you know, just doing that allows me to get the avatar in here. Um, usually, the one, the major thing you're worrying about is going to be, um, I think that I already forgot the name, Oras is in, yeah. Uh, this would be the thing there. You can see that's not displaying correctly, and that's no surprise. I don't have any of the correct shaders on here, so what we're going to just do is we're going to select all these, and we're just going to set these to the standard shader for now. That does not look very good, but that's fine. Actually, it probably wouldn't even look super great with the other thing. Well, maybe part of the reason it doesn't look good is because from the front, um, the cape is made of one line of polygons, and a lot of shaders won't show both sides. Where's that one? That one is. It, it doesn't look like it's lighted very well, but, you know, I kind of wanted to fire this one up and take a look at it. You know, I'm not seeing anything that makes me say, oh, yeah, I'm definitely going to upload this. But, to be fair, the character themselves kind of intrigued me because they had one of the best battle musics in Pokemon ever. Like, <clears throat> I used to like the champion Cynthia theme the most, and then uh, her final battle theme kind of overrode that all. So, if I really wanted to, I could just upload this as it is, you know. The truth of the matter is I don't have shader stuff correctly set up here, but usually you only have to worry about that insofar as getting something to look right. And you can always go with other options. Uh, VRChat Mobile is going to be all your Quest supported ones, for example, so it might be okay to get something to look good using those. A shader is basically, these are the rules for how we're going to draw. You can see here under the standard shader, um, you know, there's all these things, emissions, normals, heights, metallic. Albedo is going to be your normal colors, you know, affected by light sort of stuff. Uh, it looks a little more complicated than it actually is because um, I had all of them selected. There you can kind of see the little thing there, that thing there, and if I go back to Toonlit, Toonlit is pretty common on, um, <clears throat> it's pretty common for, um, what's it called, um, quest supported avatars. I guess one thing I'm curious about, so yeah, this is an example. Um, I notice here it doesn't have any skinned meshes. So that means, yeah, that, that's just a flat texture. That's just a flat texture. It's not going to be able to do any talking. Uh, if we go back to my avatar here, it's not using the correct or best shader. It's just kind of there to 
for me to do comparisons and stuff, but you can see this is like an autumn version of the one I was using. Um, blend shapes are just an important thing that allow you to change the polygons on the face. Uh, there's stuff here that, you know, are part of eye movement sort of stuff, I guess. And then you have, um, like, the ch sound, which looks really weird, but I guess it's because you might not have any teeth. Uh, Blink Happy was the one you saw on the thing. It, it, usually there's a lot of options, especially when they come from MMD. Anger would probably be the eyelids like that, for example. Um, <clears throat> yeah, usually if you've got face-related options are here, there could can sometimes be a couple of other stuff in here. And this is this stuff is how the avatar does talking and again. Well, I thought the eye stuff might have been built in here, but well, I'm not sure. I haven't taken too close of a look to see where that information is stored, but um, the blinking is at least in here, I think, so that they can do blend meshing. The idea being that if you take two blend shapes and you can transition between like the ch sound and the s sound, or the ch e. So. That, that's kind of how VR chat transitions between stuff. Usually you don't need to know those kind of details until you need to figure them out them yourself. But uh, let's go ahead and close that because I'm not going to need that anymore. Uh, if we go back to here, if we go back to the tutorials real quick. Again, you know, first there's just uploading something that somebody uploaded here. So I could run around with Zinnia without any eye tracking or without any... Um, mouth movement. It will only have the default emotes. Uh, I didn't even check to see what sort of hands it can do. And I guess it's too late I navigate away, but it can probably do hands just fine. It's it's pretty common for an avatar to have uh, multiple fingers like you would expect. But uh, yeah. So you can very quickly get something from VRC mods uploaded to VR chat. Not a problem. Um, it just once you want to start tweaking and changing stuff that things start to get slower and you start learning more and edge cases. This one is about um, taking a model without any real data and um, you know adding some bone data to it and some weighting to it and you know this one is also pretty quick you know very quick video. This one how to add lip sync to your avatar. Now this one's going to require Blender for adding lip sync because you're going to have to define, you know, shapes and it gives you some stuff to do and the truth of the matter is you could probably do something even simpler than what this one has, has. but, you know, it gives you details. This one tells you about how to use Unity to add stuff and common issues. You know, th there's good simple stuff here at VRC Mods. You don't have to worry about needing to know a lot of the nitty gritty details until problems start coming up or you start wanting to do advanced things. Which, you know, to be fair, um, you know, it's probably going to happen. But usually a lot of the details like that is, are where Blender comes in. Blender, of course, is a much more detail-oriented 3D modeling. So with Unity, it's more designed for scene sort of stuff, but it is used to kind of put together all the information related to an avatar. So, for example, this rogue... Um, you know, this one is actually a copy of the original. The original is hidden, but this is this one is where I put some dynamic bones. I guess the original has no. This one has a copy of the VRC avatar descriptor and the pipeline manager. So, th this is stuff that just kind of find, allows VR chat to know how to do what to do with it. But mostly, and I, I just have this here for height comparison because this is about the height of the after this person normally uses. I'm not sure if I'm going to change the height yet for them or not. I'm probably going to worry about uploading it first. I need to get uh, this knife working with them and this pouch working, but usually that's just about customizing avatars and not really about uploading your first avatar. Once you can upload, you can start playing around with and figuring out 
what you need to do to customize. And here in Unity, you know, you can, you know, set up so that you can see. I've got this one set up. I've got this one set up to, um, you know, play Megalovania because I created that animation. It's a pretty elaborate animation. It allows me to see um, how the avatar moves around with all that stuff, uh, especially with the um, cape that I added. That cloak is not a natural part of the avatar. Um, it's pretty easy for me to add stuff to it because of the way I've set stuff up. So if I just do that, then maybe change this one to snake dying. Then I could go to I can go to that controller and instead test out um, animator animation. Instead, let's uh, test out uh, what it would look like with that animation. You know, pretty simple, pretty fun. A lot of that is just preparatory stuff I've done where I've saved um, the audio object as its own standalone thing with appropriate name. I know where to put it. I know where my animation is expecting to find it. You can kind of see down here there's a lot of animation data, but down here, armature slash, slash death longer. You know, that, that's just stuff I've defined. But a lot of that is just more advanced details, and this is more about like rigging everything together, whereas this is about, okay, let's get the basic things defined. You can kind of see that the textures hadn't been changed yet because I changed those in the other thing. The cloak is still there. That's actually two cloaks so that I can have an inner and an outer render so that it works perfectly fine on Quest as well. Uh, if I hide the body, you can see all the bones that are part of this. You can see the tail, the cloak, you can see the ears, the head, the skirt, a lot of stuff there. Um, it's pretty easy to mess things up in Blender, but, um, you know, fortunately there are good resources out there, good videos and good, um, things. So for example, uh, the Cat's Blender plugin is a pretty... Um, uh, oops, wrong directory. Pretty important. So if we go to Suisei Seki and do that, you know, we can bring her in, uh, do fix model. It's going to change the rendering mode for me so it looks fine, but it's also cleaning up some of the textures, so you know, that looks pretty good. But this, this isn't quite ready to go because there's no fizz memes, there's no eye tracking, you know, I'd have to define that. Uh, usually you have to do some bone restructuring in order to support um, dynamic bones pretty well. So for example, this hair here, if I you know, expand this over here, and let's, oops, uh, let's shrink that down a little bit. You can see all, all the skirt bones come from the hips here, and it's really advantageous to put all of them into one thing. So you do a lot of bone reparenting and stuff, wow, Jesus. There's a lot of stuff in here. But let, let's uh, climb up into the head because we can probably find um, a bunch of hair related stuff. White chocolate. Jeez, I, I've never really fired this one up before. There's some interesting options here. But you know, there, there would be some restructuring of bones I would do. Um, for optimization, atlasing would be nice. I've never really gotten it to work too well, and I haven't really run into problems with not using it. Oh, look at all those random ass bones in the air. Those are probably what need to be fixed. Look, there's one little shit over there. So this one might have a lot of bones to just delete, like you got ripped out of something else. But, yeah, you know. Usually you don't have to worry about the intricate details of Blender. Blender is really useful if you want to, say, uh, do something that's more about editing the details of the avatar. Like, let, let's say for now, if we take a look at the materials on this avatar, we'll probably see none of them translated. Let's just translate all of them. Not that that'll help, since it'll be literal. Thing. But, you know, somewhere in here, maybe one of these are the eyes. 
probably that one. Uh, I guess the best way to find out would be to go to edit mode and then the select. Yeah. So those are the eyes. So sometimes the eyes are part of a giant mesh for the avatar and maybe you separate them out. I think uh, the one I had before is actually a really good example of that where the eyes you can see the eyes are already a different color. The original one was actually red-eyed, and in here they're blue. What I've done is I actually separated the eyes into their own um, texture, I, I, and I re-UV mapped it. I guess uh, that's not showing it very well, so if I do a select, you can kind of see that the two eyes are kind of overlapping on there. One of them had to be flipped upside down in order to keep the coloring right. Which is fine, you know, that's just what you do, but UV editing, um, you know, uh, UV editing allowed me to not only assign these, um, the eyes to, um, let's do that, the eyes to this texture I created, but then I, you know, position the textures correctly on the thing. That allows me to actually make the eyes have different properties from the rest of the body. In particular, I can make them glow in the dark. So, you know, you might use Blender to do something like that. Um, the cloak, in order to make sure that the cloak is attached to the arms and moves with the arms, um, you know, I need to do that from within Blender. But if you're just doing something simple like putting a knife in a hand, you can do that from Unity. So yeah, you don't necessarily need Blender. Blender is helpful when you start getting into little details. Everything else here is more for asset creation. So like in here, I'm um, I've got you know GIMP is just an editor, a graphics editor. Here is where I've created a. I think I, I took this and I'm like eh, it doesn't look quite right on the little patch, but when I you know smooth it out so it's kind of got the right kind of colors, but it looks weird, then that, that that would be the texture for this pouch. You know, I, I just created something simple there. Whereas I also have a bunch of manga that another avatar throws out. Um, this was recoloring the avatar, and I might have to do a little more tweaking, because I haven't seen what it looks like in VR chat yet. There's the eye, the cloak, I've created an inner and an outer color, and, you know, so, you know, I this is massaging and preparation of assets. This, this would be simple textural graphical ones. Um, Audacity is really good for um, you know, editing down and making sure you got the right sort of thing. So like, you know, I was able to amplify this one so that it's just the right volume and I could go more. I edited it out beginning and ending um, pauses. <laughs> So I've got a nice clean sound. Um, I could make it OGG or MP3, you know, my UOD supports whatever. I think though it better supports the looping of OGGs than MP3s, but that's an aside. Um, but as you can see, um, a lot of, there's a lot of stuff you can do here, but when you get down to it, you know, I've gone above and beyond the complicated stuff. And when we go down to the simple stuff, um, actually, none of the ones here are going to be simple because I, no, Shaggy's simple. Ah, yeah, whatever. Shaggy's nice and simple. Um, I could do some stuff to fix it so that it works better in full body because it kind of gets really janky in full body. But, you know, for the most part, you know, all I did was upload it, and I think I changed the materials so that they use just VRChat Mobile Tune Lit. You know, it doesn't render both sides of polygons, but this one's simple enough where that doesn't matter. And I added a bunch of animations to it. Literally threw this one together in maybe a half an hour to an hour. And it would have been even quicker if I wasn't trying to put a bunch of animations on it and upload a quest version of it as well. Because, you know, I hadn't quite figured out the entire details of doing it. Now I think I do. Anyways, that's a lot of stuff. But again, 
remember, uh, I'm I'm giving things from the perspective of, oh yeah, I've got a lot of little things that I like to change and adjust. I like glowing eyes, so I will take an avatar, bring it into Blender, and put the eyes on a different um, texture just so I can make them glow. Whereas you can begin by uploading your own. That's what JoJo started doing, and that's what her world is uh, full of a lot of this stuff. But as she got more and more into it, she got learned how to. Well, actually, she hasn't done any of... She's done how to add accessories to VR chat avatars. Oh. This is how to upload avatars to VRC mods. Well, that's good. Because, you know, I might want to start doing that. Give back to the community that's been given to me. But, <clears throat> for now, I think that's absolutely everything I was going to cover. Let me know if I missed anything. Y'all? Have a Merry Christmas. See y'all next week.